Sup Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So today, we're going to revisit a subject I haven't covered in a long time, microneedling. I get a lot of questions from people asking me about what type of microneedling device they should use, whether it should be a derma stamp or a derma roller. I get asked about what the optimal length of the needle should be, how frequently I should microneedle, whether or not I should do it before or after treatment, blah, 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 etc., etc. Well, guess what? I am telling you right now that you don't need to do any of that that crap. Microneedling is laughably overrated and it is no coincidence that the people who like to hype up microneedling more than anything just so happen to also sell microneedling devices or programs centered around microneedling. It is funny and befuddling to me how finasteride gets so much hate despite the fact that it is the most clinically proven treatment on the market, yet microneedling, which is next to useless, gets universal praise from almost everybody except for me. I've made my opinions on microneedling pretty clear in my previous videos where I go over the research on microneedling, and I'll link them below in case you haven't seen them yet. Now, of course, I know there are a lot of microneedling fanboys out there who swear by it, and that's perfectly fine. I don't care if you want to use a microneedling device, and I am not trying to make you feel stupid for using it. The fact is, though, is that microneedling is not an effective treatment for androgenic alopecia, and for what little benefit it may have as an adjunctive therapy, that is far overshadowed by the fact that microneedling may carry some long-term deleterious effects for your scalp health. If you don't like what I have to say about microneedling, that is fine, of course. You don't have to listen, but the only reason I am bringing up these problems with microneedling is because nobody else will. So I was reminded about microneedling because one of my subscribers brought up this study from a gentleman named Robert England. I'd never heard of the guy before, but I heard he's supposed to be a medical editor of some kind who specializes in brute flu research. I don't know the full story behind that, but it's not important. What is relevant, though, is that he and his research team published a recent review of microneedling for hair loss. Now, this isn't original research we're talking about here. It's just a summary of the studies on microneedling that have already been done. He spends some time in the paper theorizing how microneedling might work to treat hair loss, which is interesting, but Mr. England missed a crucial step in his paper. He never proves that microneedling even works to begin with. What is the point of trying to explain how something works when it is still debatable as towards whether or not it even works at all? Theorizing about a drug's mechanism of action is fine and dandy, but it doesn't mean anything if you don't have any outcome data to show that it works in the first place. Believe it or not, there are a lot of drugs in the market today that work safely without us knowing why. Even minoxidil's mechanism of action isn't fully understood. We know it works though, so having a discussion about minoxidil's mechanism of action is relevant. But if microneedling doesn't work to begin with, then who cares what the theory behind it is? Microneedling has been around for a long time now, and there has been plenty of time to do well-designed studies to test the theory as to whether or not it works, but to to date, there has never been any good outcome data demonstrating that microneedling is effective as a hair loss treatment. Well, as it turns out, Mr. England comes to the same conclusions I did in my videos on microneedling that again are linked below in the description. He concludes that there is evidence microneedling may be useful as an adjunct therapy, such as when it is used in combination with topical minoxidil, but he concludes that the data from microneedling is low quality and more research is needed. So basically, this study doesn't tell us anything new and achieves absolutely nothing for hair loss academia. But oh well, thanks for trying at least, Mr. England. So, like I said, Mr. England shows evidence that microneedling may help slightly in potentiating minoxidil's efficacy, which isn't something that was really contentious to begin with amongst anybody. However, when looking at microneedling data used alone as a monotherapy, the data is of extremely poor quality. Of the 22 studies Mr. England reviewed, only a total of 105 subjects were tested using microneedling as the sole therapy. The rest of the 536 subjects in these studies received microneedling combined with some other treatment usually topical minoxidil, so there isn't a lot of scientific data on using microneedling as a monotherapy. Another problem with the studies is that there is no standardization of microneedling. Different studies use different microneedling devices, different frequencies of application, a different number of sessions, amongst many other limitations. So some of the results of these microneedling studies may be inconsistent because of different microneedling techniques used in the research. So looking at the studies of using microneedling alone as a monotherapy for androgenic alopecia, you can see that, like I pointed out in my previous videos, the results are totally inconsistent. Of the six studies done that included microneedling alone as a therapy, three showed a beneficial effect on hair growth, and three showed no effect. 
However, in seven studies that looked at microneedling used alongside 5% minoxidil for androgenic alopecia, six of the seven studies showed improvement with the combination of microneedling plus minoxidil. Like I said, the theory as to why microneedling might enhance the effect of minoxidil isn't too important or controversial, nor is it something I disagree with, but most likely the only thing that is really happening is that the breaks in the skin produced by the needling just cause more drug absorption into the scalp since the punctures caused by microneedling in the skin allow Allow the drug to get closer to the hair follicles. It's not rocket science, it's just simple logic. There are other theories about how microneedling may work, such as by enhancing the conversion of minoxidil into minoxidil sulfate, which is the active form of the drug, or that microneedling works by enhancing the WNT Wnt pathway, which is a hair growth stimulating pathway. But all of this is just speculation, and it probably isn't true, because if microneedling could upregulate the Wnt pathway, then we'd see stronger evidence that it is an effective monotherapy, which is something that is never been demonstrated. If microneedling worked for anything more than just improving minoxidil absorption, then we would know by now, and there's less evidence for these speculative theories than the simple idea that microneedling just increases drug absorption. Now, Mr. England mentions that in the studies he reviewed, the side effects of microneedling were mild, including pain, scalp irritation, and mild redness. So overall, this article gives a favorable view of microneedling as a safe and probably effective therapy when it's combined with minoxidil, but it's not proven to be effective on its own. So, fair enough. Like I said, that's what I concluded in my own previous video on microneedling, and I am glad that Robert England agrees with me here. By the way, Mr. England's review article isn't the only one on microneedling. I'll post some others in the description section below, but they all go over mostly the same data and have the same conclusions about microneedling. So thank you, Mr. England, for creating a study that tells everybody what we already know about microneedling. Good job, bro. Now, to be fair, there are dermatologists who are optimistic about microneedling for conditions beyond hair growth, but all these articles emphasize that the data on using microneedling alone for hair growth is very sketchy and of extremely poor quality. So you you may be tempted to ask me right now, but Kevin, sure, maybe microneedling isn't all that great, but if it helps with minoxidil's absorption, why not use it? Seems like a no-brainer, bro. Well, if that were the full story behind microneedling, then I'd happily agree. However, you may have noticed that this video is about the dark side of microneedling, and that is because poking holes in your scalp repeatedly over many years and causing chronic inflammation may not be such a good idea after all, and there are some real downsides to microneedling. Generally speaking, chronic repeated injury to human tissue leads to the creation of fibrosis, also known as scar tissue. Androgenic alopecia also leads to fibrosis of the hair follicles, as Mr. England notes in his article right here. So, potentially using a technique that could produce fibrosis to treat a condition that causes fibrosis really doesn't make a lot of sense. But beyond that, every time you microneedle, you break the very important skin barrier that protects us from the germs and toxins of the outside world. This was demonstrated in this case report right here, in which a woman using a microneedling device inadvertently spread a herpes zoster infection, meaning shingles, to her face. This is not surprising because anything applied to the skin or scalp can be absorbed through the skin barrier when using microneedling. For example, in this article here, three women developed severe allergic reactions after microneedling of their faces for skin rejuvenation. They had applied various different skin serums to their faces, and the microneedling basically tattooed these substances into their skin, which resulted in a severe severely ugly allergic reaction. I'll go ahead and show you what this looked like. Clearly not a pretty sight at all. Now, these rashes didn't occur immediately after microneedling. In the first case, the rash developed two weeks after microneedling, and despite being treated with steroids, she got worse and developed fever and joint pains. This continued for three more months. In the second case, a woman was treated for acne with dermarolling and developed a rash a few days later. She got worse over two months and also developed joint pains. Both of these cases were then treated with topical steroids and other treatments as well, but after nine months, both continued to have the same rash in the face, which is a pretty awful thing considering that they were using this as a beauty treatment. In the third case, the same kind of rash appeared a few days after microneedling, but she was luckier this time because her rash resolved after three weeks of treatment with oral steroids and antibiotics. So yes, I know these women weren't microneedling their scalps, but many people use various hair treatment products on their scalps, and microneedling could inadvertently put these 
possible allergenic products directly into their skin, resulting in reactions like these women had. If that occurs, it is very hard to reverse. The authors of this series of case reports even thinks that microneedling should be regulated, and they say, quote, we believe that numerous similar adverse reactions are happening and are not reported in the medical literature, unquote. And the authors are absolutely correct here. This study is not the only case report of severe reactions to microneedling that included systemic symptoms. In this report here, two sisters who received microneedling under a doctor's supervision using a sterilized microneedling device developed a severe reaction, including swollen lymph nodes, redness, and prolonged bleeding, as well as a headache. Even antibiotics didn't help them. And after two weeks, one of the sisters developed a rash all over her body and swelling in the face. She had to be hospitalized and treated with steroids, and she gradually got better over two weeks. In the case of these sisters, the reaction may have been due to an allergy to nickel, since the needles of the device contained 8% nickel. In any case, this study points out that there are more risks to microneedling than are generally realized, including infections from non-sterile devices, allergies, needle breakage, and excessive needle penetration due to needle length or excessive force of application. Nobody is talking about these risks because, like I said, most people who promote microneedling are either selling microneedling devices or programs centered around using microneedling as a drug-free way to fight hair loss. And it turns out we're not even out of the woods yet when it comes to microneedling's potential dangers. There is another theoretical concern of microneedling, which could be the most dangerous concern yet, and that is that scar tissue caused by repeated microneedling could actually lead to skin cancer. Now, it's known that there is an increased risk of skin cancer from exposure to ultraviolet light, whether it be from an artificial source like a tanning bed or a natural source like sunlight. However, it's also been shown that scar tissue is a risk factor for developing skin cancer. For example, in this study, here, a form of skin cancer called basal cell carcinoma was found to be common in patients with injuries and scar tissue, and the cancers actually formed adjacent to the healed scars, as you can see in this figure here. So, cancer can be associated with injuries, and in fact, specifically wounding hair follicles can cause tumors. This was studied in this article right here. It turns out that basal cell carcinoma, the type of cancer we just mentioned, is actually thought to come from human hair follicles because the cancer cells are similar to hair follicle cells. Normally, hair follicles don't turn cancerous, which of course is very fortunate for us. What's troublesome, though, is that this study was able to show that the trigger that can turn a normal hair follicle into a cancerous hair follicle is wounding. Now, the study is a very complex analysis of what happens biochemically with wounding to cause cancer, but the bottom line can be summarized simply by what the authors conclude. The authors of the study say, quote, our study demonstrates that the cell of origin for basal cell cancer can depend on extrinsic factors such as wounding. Given the slow-growing nature of these tumors, and the fact that even small incisional wounds can recruit oncogene-expressing stem cells from the follicle, it is possible that the formation of human basal cell cancers may be temporarily removed from their provocative injuries, or that the associated injuries may go unnoticed." Unquote. So you heard that, Jooms. Even small wounds, such as the tiny puncture wounds caused by microneedling, could potentially result in skin cancer. And it may take a while before these cancers show up, even years, because skin cancers like this are slow growing. Now, this isn't proof that microneedling can cause skin cancer, but it is worrisome data nevertheless, because there aren't any long-term follow-up studies of people who do a lot of microneedling. So I'm not saying this stuff to scare you guys, but it is important we balance out some of the overly optimistic reports about microneedling, with some of this more sobering data. The truth is, we don't know the long-term effects of microneedling, especially repeated microneedling, and we don't know if it is safe. Like I said, the only reason I am telling you Tombs this is because nobody else will, since almost everybody who promotes microneedling seems to have a conflict of interest. So I guess you could say that is one of the advantages of my channel, since I do not sell anything, and I have nothing to gain financially based on whether or not you follow my advice. Speaking of which, what is my advice for people who want to have an adjunctive therapy that will help improve minoxidil's efficacy without exposing themselves to the dangers of microneedling? Well, fortunately, there is an alternative here, Tombs. It is called tretinoin. Tretinoin is a synthetic retinoid that, when applied daily to the scalp, can help to upregulate the sulfotransferase enzyme, which is the enzyme that converts minoxidil into its active form, minoxidil sulfate. This is especially helpful because there are some people who genetically are deficient in this enzyme, which is why only about 60% of people get good results with topical minoxidil. Tretinoin can effectively turn a minoxidil non-responder into a responder, and I made a video about using tretinoin to improve minoxidil, which I'll link below. A 
Another option would be to use a stronger concentration of topical minoxidil, like 10 or 15%. Although I should warn you, chums, that 10 and 15% minoxidil only work better in people who are non-responders to 5% minoxidil. Strangely enough, 10 and 15% minoxidil actually work worse than 5% minoxidil in people who are already responders to 5% minoxidil. So sometimes more isn't always better. I discuss this all in my video about stronger concentrations of minoxidil that is also linked below in the description. So that's pretty much my advice on microneedling. You can take it or leave it. I don't care if you choose to ignore what I say about microneedling, and I don't mean any offense towards the hair loss YouTubers who do support microneedling, but I at least hope you guys understand now why I'm not as enthusiastic about it as others and why it is important we have a balance of information when going over data. Remember, there is no emotion, there is peace, there is no ignorance, there is knowledge, there is no passion, there is serenity, there is no chaos, there is harmony, there is no death, there is finasteride. Thank you for watching, Chooms. God bless.